This is a tutorial on how to understand integrals. Now before we dive into this concept, let's first take a look at an example situation of where we would need to use an integral. For example, let's consider this graph of speed over time. Now you can see that in our y-axis, or our f of x-axis, we're measuring the speed in miles per hour. And along our x-axis, we're measuring time in hours. Now let's say we want to use this graph in order to determine the distance that this certain object went. How would we be able to do that? Well, you may remember from previous examples of doing rate of change that when you do speed times time, you'll get distance. And this is because our speed is being measured in miles per hour, and when it's being multiplied by time, which is also in hours, the hours on bottom and the hours on top will cancel out, leaving us with miles, or our measurement for the distance. So similar to this idea of taking our speed and multiplying it by time, we need to take the values for speed from our function and multiply them by our values of time. Now the way that we would do that with this graph, where our speed is our y-axis and time is our x-axis, the act of multiplying those two together would be finding the area under the curve of our function. So if we could find the area of this shaded region here, that value would be the distance that this particular object traveled. Now this is where integrals come into play. The concept of an integral is used to find the area under curves of functions. So now that we know that, let's take a look at an example. Let's consider the graph of f of x equals x. And let's say we want to find the area under its curve between the x values of 1 and 7. How would we go about doing that? Well, one method we could use is to divide up this interval between 1 and 7 into equal width sections, and then find the area of the rectangles created by those sections. For example, let's say we want to split up our interval, or this section right here, into two equal sections, like this. And what I mean by equal sections is that their widths are the same. So this width would be equal to this width. And we could call these widths our change in x, or delta x. And they're going to have the same exact value. Now when we take the area of the two rectangles from these sections, they could actually be drawn two different ways. For example, our two rectangles can be this, which in a sense would give us a lower limit to our area, since it doesn't completely cover the entire section under the curve, or our two rectangles can be drawn this way, which in this case would be like an upper limit to the area, since it does cover everything under the curve, but it also gets some area above the curve as well. Now before we decide which rectangles we want to use, let's first determine what our change in x is. Now the way that we could find that is by first taking our upper limit of the interval and subtracting the lower limit of the interval and then dividing by the number of sections that we want. So in this case, since our interval goes from 1 to 7, 7 would be the upper limit to the interval, or b, and then we'll subtract the lower limit of the interval, which is 1. And then we'll divide it by the number of sections that we want, which in this case we want it in two sections. So n would equal 2. And now we just need to simplify that. 7 minus 1 is 6. And then when we divide that by 2, we'll get a delta x value of 3. So based on this, we know that from x equals 1 to this x value right here, there will be a distance of 3. And likewise, from this x value right here to x equals 7, there will also be a distance of 3. So in order to get this x value, we could either take our lower limit 
and add our change in x, or we could take the upper limit and subtract the change in x. So if we do 1 plus 3, or 7 minus 3, either way, we'll get an x value of 4. Now that we know the x values involved with our subintervals or our different sections, let's use the rectangles that will cause us to find a left-hand sum. Now a left-hand sum is just one way of calculating the area under the curve. And the way that a left-hand sum works is that we'll take a look at each subinterval individually and we'll use the output value on the left-hand side. For example, for our subinterval from x equals 1 to x equals 4, we have an output right here as well as right here. But since we're doing a left hand sum, we'll want to choose the output value on the left. And then same thing goes for our second subinterval from x equals 4 to x equals 7. We'll have the output value right here as well as an output value over here. But since we're doing a left-hand sum, we'll want to choose the value on the left for that subinterval, which will be the output at x equals 4. And now that we've determined what output values we're going to use, that also tells us how our rectangles will be drawn. We'll just extend a straight line across at those output values, like this. So now we just want to find the area of those two rectangles that were created. So at this point, we'll just use typical geometry to find the areas of those rectangles. So first, we could find the area of our smaller rectangle. Now in order to do this, we'll need to multiply the base times the height, which in this case, our base, going from one to four, would be a distance of three. And then our height going from 0 to 1 would be a distance of 1. So the area of our first rectangle will be 3 times 1, or in other words, 3. Now let's find the area of the second rectangle. Now this time, the base is going from x equals 4 to x equals 7, which is also a distance of 3. Which makes sense because we said that each of the bases should have an equal length for each subinterval. So our base is 3, and now we need to multiply it by the height, which in this case, the height of our rectangle goes from 0 to 4, which is a distance of 4. So the area of this rectangle will be 3 times 4, which is 12. Now that we have the areas of those two rectangles, we just need to add them up to get the total area under the curve based on our left-hand sum. So 3 plus 12 is 15. So from this, we could say that the left-hand sum for the area under our curve from x equals 1 to x equals 7 is 15. Now that we've done that, Let's try something different with this graph. Now this time, instead of using two subintervals, let's use three. And before we draw any rectangles, let's find out what the equal distance is for the bases of our subintervals. So again, the change in x is going to equal our upper limit to the interval minus the lower limit divided by our number of sections, or subintervals. Well again, our interval is from 1 to 7, so the upper limit will be 7, minus our lower limit, which is 1, and then we'll divide by our number of subintervals, which is 3. And now when we do that math, 7 minus 1 is 6, then when we divide that by 3, we get our value for the change in x to be 2. So the distance for each of our bases is 2, which means the corresponding x values 
between each of our subintervals will be 3 and 5. Now that we have that covered, let's go on to find the right-hand sum for the area under the curve. So if we take a look at our first subinterval between 1 and 3, we have an output value here as well as here. But since we want to do the right-hand sum, we'll take the output value on the right. And then in between x equals 3 and x equals 5, again, we'll have the output value right here, as well as the output value at x equals 5. And since we're doing a right-hand sum, we'll choose the value on the right. And then finally, for our last subinterval between 5 and 7, again, we'll have the output value at x equals 5 and the output value at x equals 7. And since we're doing a right-hand sum, we'll choose the value on the right. So now that we have the values that we've chosen to draw our rectangles, we could just draw a straight line at those output values. And when we do that, we'll create these rectangles right here, which means the areas that we want to calculate will look like this. Now at this point, we want to get the area of each rectangle. Now before we start though, we know that the base for each of the rectangles is going to be 2. So rather than writing that out three different times, let's just write it out once and then put each of the heights in parentheses. So for example, the height of our first rectangle goes from 0 to 3, which would be a distance of 3. And we'll add that to the height of our second rectangle, which goes from 0 to 5, which gives us a distance of 5. And then at this point, we'll add the height of the last rectangle, which goes from 0 to 7, which gives us a distance of 7. So at this point, when we simplify, our base of 2 will be distributed to each of the heights. So let's simplify. So we have 2 times 3 plus 5, which is 8, and then 8 plus 7, which is 15. And then 2 times 15 will give us a value of 30. So based on the right-hand sum, the area under the curve from x equals 1 to x equals 7 is roughly 30. So now that we know how to use a right-hand sum, let's go on to find the actual area under the curve. Now when you're finding the actual area under the curve of a function, you're finding the integral of the function. Now before we go about doing this, let's write our current example into integral notation. So first of all, we'll start with the integral symbol that looks sort of like an S, which if you want to, you could think of that as finding the sum. Now if you remember, with our previous examples, we were finding the sum of rectangles, which have a height and a base. Well, in this case, the height was represented by the outputs of our function. And for our function, we have f of x equals x. So that variable x will represent each of the different heights of those rectangles. And then also, if you remember from our previous examples, the base was our change in x between each of the subintervals. So right now, we have the integral of our function x times dx, which the d also represents delta, or the change in x. So right now, the integral notation is in a general form of finding the area under the curve for our entire function of f of x. Now more specifically, we're finding the area under the curve from x equals 1 to x equals 7. So in order to specify those bounds, 
you'll have the lower limit on bottom and the upper limit on top. So we'll have our lower bound, or one, below the integration sign, and our upper bound of seven above the integration sign. So this is how you would write out our particular problem in integral notation. Now the way that we could find the actual area under our curve is by splitting it up into geometric shapes that we know how to find. For example, we could split it up into a triangle and a rectangle. And from there, find the areas and add them together. So let's start off with the rectangle. We have a height of 1 and then a base going from 1 to 7, which is a distance of 6. So when we multiply those two together, we get an area of 6 for the rectangle. Now let's do the triangle. Now with the triangle, remember we have to do 1 half times the base times the height. Now our base again goes from 1 to 7, which is a distance of 6. And then our height also goes from 1 to 7, which is also a distance of 6. So when we do 6 times 6, we get 36, but when we multiply that by 1 half, we'll get 18. Now from there, we just sum up the two areas together in order to get the total area under the curve. So 6 plus 18 will give us a value of 24. So the actual area under the curve of our function from x equals 1 to x equals 7 is 24. Now you know the basics to understanding integrals.